right? Uh, CS4510, uh, LO5B. The title is Chomsky Normal Form. Well, we're going to spend the first half on finishing uh, the remaining six chapters, the remaining four chapters of uh, syntactic structures. Excuse me, five chapters of syntactic structures. Um, chapter six is on the goals of linguistic theory. Like, what should be a satisfactory linguistic theory? How good? Um, like, how high should we set the bar for what we're able to achieve? And he talks about three models of, of a linguistic theory. First is one that takes as input a corpus. A corpus is a set of sentences, perhaps finite. Uh, it's samples of language. You hear in several utterances, and from that, you may record uh, and have an explanation for it. Um, you may think of a corpus like evidence. Uh, you have certain pieces of evidence. You record the evidence, and you output an explanation for the evidence. In a similar idea, a uh, the first idea is that you take as input in a corpus, and you output some grammar. And a grammar is then an explanation for the structure and combination and uh, the explanatory power of what those sentences are. Um, the second model of a linguistic theory is one that takes as input uh, a, a corpus, but also a grammar itself. And outputs a yes or no if it is true or if it is not true that, a, that the grammar sufficiently explains the corpus or not. So in some sense, this is explaining a, a theory. It's like given, a, given evidence, exp, uh, describe a theory. This is a model of linguistic theory that says, given a, a theory and a corpus, is this a sufficient corpus for the, is this a sufficient explanation for the evidence? That's what this theory says. And the third model is that you're given uh, a grammar G1, a grammar G2, and you're given a corpus. And that you will output either G1 or G2. And this is a, a theory that it says, OK, given two grammars and a, and a corpus, again, a corpus is like the evidence in a scientific system. It's the set of sentences. It's our measurements or observations of the world. Instead, it's our measurements or observations of what is grammatical or not grammatical. G1 and G2 are two perhaps competing or contradictory scientific, scientific theories. Perhaps they're not contradictory. They just explain things in different ways. And the linguistic theory should output what is, an ex what is a better theory. Not necessarily what is even a good theory, or what is a sufficient theory, or any metric like that, but relatively, one is better than the other. Uh, Chomsky then goes on to say that these are kind of too strong. These are unreasonable models. And this is a weak. This is uh, weak, but OK. And if you think about, if you think about in reference to all science that has ever been done ever, a physicist measuring uh, the bouncing of a ball, a chemist trying to explain the way atoms arrange themselves, something like this. It's rare in theory that you're just going to be given your evidence and you'll be able to output a sufficient explanation for all evidence observed. Instead, you can make a hypothesis and maybe you make some more observational evidence and you try to confirm that or not. Uh, that's too strong, even not just for us, not just for linguists, because they're not working in something as formal as uh, physics or chemistry. But perhaps for all science, this model, given a grammar and a corpus, is the grammar, grammar sufficient or not? Even for uh, more formal fields, again, like physics or something, given evidence and given a theory, does the theory explain the evidence or not? That may be true or not, but is it a sufficient theory? Does it explain all evidence that may, we, we may see in the future? Does it make satisfiable predictions? This also is too strong for linguistics theory. This is the best you can do. Given two explanations of how sentences are two sentences are generated, perhaps one is a more sufficient explanation than the other. That's the best we can hope for this. And perhaps through repeated applications of this, we can refine ourselves and guide ourselves to where a better explanation. What is a grammar? You know, not, he's not trying to determine a grammar for all in English. But why are lang what is a process to form a grammar? Not the literal grammar of English itself. Like, you may go to the dictionary, and you may find that they actually have a context-free grammar for how English should be defined. But he's not determined what is a grammar for English, but how should one produce a grammar for English? And those are two different processes. 
uh, chapter 7. We'll skip this one, but it's some transformations in English. This is the longest chapter in the book, and it's kind of tedious and annoying, and I don't care about English enough. Uh, but basically, he actually, does, he actually does try to derive a context-free grammar for English. He does a lot of mechanical work. He looks at many extremal sentences, morph memes, and things like this. All this complicated science is going on. Uh, we don't really care about the about linguistics itself, but the theory of linguistics. So you can go read the chapter if you want. The book is, again, only 90 pages. You could finish it in like two hours. So you can go read that if you would like. Um, chapter 8, the explanatory power of linguistics. This one, I think, is also more important. So again, uh, Ch Chomsky makes reference to the fact that a suitable explanation, uh, that linguistics, linguistics theory should provide a suitable explanation as one does, and it should share certain traits that physics and chemistry have. And I've made that analogy several times. When you have a scientific theory, a scientific theory does two things. Uh, it explains all past evidence. And it can be extended to uh, make future predictions. So given a specific explanation about past evidence, you can extrapolate from the scientific theory itself and explain things in the future. And he says linguistics, any ex satisfactory explanation of Linguistics should also have this explanatory power. He's like, well, if these things are true, then maybe we should find this set of sentences perhaps to be as true of that. Two examples I can give of the explanatory power, not just of linguistics, but in, I guess, all of science, is um, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Heisenberg derives some equation. Let delta of x be error uh, in position. And let uh, uh, delta p be error in momentum. And, he, and actually, these are supposed to be standard deviations. But let's suppose these are error, error in measuring position and error in measuring uh, momentum. He derives the following equation of delta x delta p is greater than or equal to some h bar over 2. Or h bar over 2 is some constant, some atomic constant, right? Um, Two things we observe immediately about this equation. So you have an explanation that explains past evidence. But just, just by looking at the function, physicists have been doing this for maybe a 1,000 years. You just look at the function, and you, you can extrapolate what the behaviors of, of what the function is supposed to explain just by looking at the function itself. First off, we know that because these, the product of these two is greater than, a, greater than 0, both of these can't be 0 simultaneously, right? Also, if you take the limit of 1 to 0, then the other uh, diverges, right? Suppose you want to very accurately measure the position of an object. The, better, the more accurate you are with measuring the position of that object, the less accurate you'll end up being with measuring the momentum. Today, we take this intuitively as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You, can, you either know where you are or you know how fast you're going, but you're not both. Not only do we know that you can't have both, but there's, a, there's this direct trade-off between both. The more accurate you are in position, the less accurate you are in momentum. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle wasn't generated because he was like, yeah, you can't measure both. You can do one or the other. But he, first, you get this equation out, and then you're like, well, just looking at the math, you, know, you can take the reciprocal. You, do, you take the limit. Obviously, one or the other, but not both. Right? Another famous example is uh, gravity. Was it Aristotle or Archimedes or something? He was like, yeah. Uh, heavier objects fall faster. So if you drop a feather, it falls really slowly. And then if you drop an anvil, you know, like Willy Coyote, you drop an anvil. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. You drop the anvil, it, it falls really fast, right? But the feather falls really slowly. And this was like 600 BC. And nobody had bothered to check this until like 1600, when Galileo decided to drop an anvil and a feather off of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I don't think he actually did that, but that's like sort of how the story goes. And he noticed that they fell at the same speed. 
Now, Aristotle made observations, or maybe it was Archimedes, I don't remember, made observations that the, uh, the feather does fall slower when you drop it in practice because it has that little gliding thing it does. But that's because of the air resistance and not because of the mass of the object. Um, so uh, Galileo takes Archimedes' theory and extends it into an argument, and then he finds a contradiction. Suppose that heavier objects do fall faster. Consider you're at the top of the leaning power of Pisa, and you drop two big blobs of water. Okay? You drop a big blob of water, and then you drop a little blob of water on top of each other, like this. If you drop them at the same time, if heavier objects fall faster, this one should fall faster than this one. right? So what's going to happen is you're going to have a big blob of water fall onto a little blob of water. They're going to merge into one big blob. And then the sum of the objects is then going to fall faster than both of them independently. This will fall faster uh, than if you were to drop them side by side. If you drop them side by side and they don't, colla they don't clash, they'll separately, they'll fall slower than if they were to be dropped on top of each other. Now, that doesn't make any sense. That violates our intuition about how objects fall. So obviously, whatever the equation of motion is for, for an object falling should not be a function of mass. So he derives the equation of motion. It's something like height is equal to 1 half uh, gt squared. And notice that there's, it's not a function of m at all. M, the mass of the object is independent of the speed it's falling. h is the height that it's currently at. t is the time that's been elapsed squared. Right? So the height is proportional only to the time uh, of that the object is taken and not its mass. So given this, he extends it. He says, well, we know that m, it should not be a variable of m. Right? These are two examples of you know, scientific theories in general being, and in some sense, this is a class about uh, science itself, computer science being a science. Um, linguistic theory should have sufficient satisfying properties as well. Now, does he find any? Maybe not. But these exist in physics and chemistry. Uh, why should they not exist in such a liberal arts like uh, um, uh, linguistics? Right? Any questions on that? Any uh, qualms, disagreements? Great. Chapter 9. Um, this is more on syntax and semantics. So he probably, we proved that there is not a bijective equivalence between the objects that are syntactically cor correct and those that, uh, which have meaning. And we gave an example, colorless, green ideas sleep furiously, is a sentence that is syntactically correct but devoid of meaning. So the semantic, if you were to take a measure of the object, it should map to zero. And the syntax of the object uh, probably maps to one. It's syntactically correct but, uh, but uh, semantically devoid. So he does two things in this chapter. First is he uh, defeats what we'll call the loser's hypothesis. So the loser's hypothesis says two utterances are phenolytically uh, distinct if and only if uh, they differ in meaning. And by phonetically distinct, we mean, I don't know what that word was supposed to be, phonetically, probably. Uh, they sound different. <coughs> so two phrases, two utterances, sound different if and only if they mean different things. Uh, that may sound true at a glance, but actually it's not true in both directions. In the, it's an if and only if, and it's false in both ways. Let's provide counterexamples to this sentence that are false in both ways. The, Senate, the loser's hypothesis here is something he disproves. He gives several counterexamples, both to the if and only if, to the if and the only if. Let's try and come up with some more counterexamples to this. Two sentences uh, are distinct. They sound different if and only if they have different meaning. Now, give me two utterances that sound different but do not differ in meaning. 
So two things that sound different. You say them out loud, they sound different. But the meaning is assigned the same value. How different is different? Like at all different? They sound different. You would agree grammatically so that these are different utterances. Yeah. Stop and halt. Stop and halt, yeah. That's an example. Let's, do we have another example? Those are assigned the same semantic meaning, yet they have totally different utterances, right? They're totally different sounding. You may distinguish those as different sounds. You would agree those are different sounds, and you may not agree that they are different. Now, let's say you, suppose you do say, well, maybe one has a slight different connotation than the other. One is British or something. So what? give me another example. Should not and shouldn't. Should not and shouldn't. That's, those definitely sound different. Any, uh, what's it called when two words mean the same thing? What? Homophones? Yeah, any two homophones would work. Uh, the, the example he uses is bachelor and unmarried man. Those, are def those definitely sound different. And by definition, it's unambiguous. Those are exactly the same. Those have exactly the same meaning. Uh, in fact, any definition of a word in the dictionary is in sense an utterance that sounds different than the word itself because you can't use the word in the definition. But by definition of it being the dictionary definition is the same, has the same meaning, right? So certainly this, the forward way is wrong. Uh, counterexample proven. Give me a counterexample for the reverse implication that give me two utterances that sound the same yet have different meaning. Uh, two utterances that have the same meaning. No, two utterances that mean different but sound the same. Yeah. Duck as in bird and duck as in lower your head. Yeah, duck and duck. What is that called? Those are even spelled differently. Not only are those, uh, those sound the same, they're written the same. What is that called when two words? Those are homophones. Oh, those are homophones. Other ones are called homonyms. Homonyms? Yeah. Okay, I don't it's not English class. I don't know. Okay. Give me another example. Uh, read and read. Read and read. Give me another example. One that, one, give me one that's spelled different. Read and read. Did you say read and read? Yeah. Oh, you no. You meant the bird. No, the plant. The read, the plant. Yeah, those sound the same, and that's, unless that one's a red. Oh, well, there you go. There's one. Okay. English is a complicated language. You had one? Oh, lead and lead? Let's, let's do another one. Sorry, lead and lead. Lead? OK, these are too similar. Let's, let's think of a, let's think of a, a more extremal one, a more complicated one. Again, an utterance is not necessarily a word that's grammatically correct, but is the way a certain sentence is heard. Give me a sentence in two contexts, if that's where you're going, that means different things. So like, if you say like, sure, like excitedly, or you could say like, sh like sure. Like, you know, like, yeah. I see. So what's communicated there, though, is in the intonation. So perhaps we would disagree and say that those are different utterances. Like sar sarcasm communicates the negation of an idea, but unfortunately it has to be sounded, it sounds different. It would be written the same, certainly. Um, I would take that, if it was written down on paper, I would, I would like take that. You say like, I hate cookies, and like, I hate cookies in front of like a website that's prompting you to track your data, and in front oh. of the car that contains the big so, so literally, again, a noun assigned two different meanings of the same noun. The example I was hoping someone would come up with is the American accent. 
You never notice Americans, we, we don't pronounce TT as little. Good old orphan British boy, we say little. I need a little bit of it, you know. Metal. Yeah, I have a metal spoon. I don't have a, I don't literally have a gold medal. Michael Phelps swimming medal. I have a, a metal spoon, you know what I mean? These are pronounced the same, yet are spelled differently and also assign different meaning. There's a third one you can do too. M-E-D-D-L-E. Metal. Yeah, you can like, you're meddling kids in, in uh, Scooby-Doo. Uh, yeah, so plenty of counterexamples both ways. So basically, whoever came up with the loser's hypothesis was the loser. We don't remember them. But they tried to make some bijective uh, association between objects that are, um, that sound different and differing meaning, but Chomsky shows that but for both ways the whole thing is just kind of, the association does not work out. So the loser's hypothesis is disproved. Um, the second thing he says is that uh, semantic properties are not even preserved under syntactic transformation. Suppose you have a sentence in your brain, and you're trying to organize the ideas in a certain way, such that when it becomes external, when you speak it, it uh, is uttered as a string of words. But before it be is thought of as a string of words, somehow you have the ideas in some sort of pre-language form. Um, as you're forming the sentence, you're making certain decisions about what it's going to be, past tense, future tense. One of those things is going to be active and passive. Active voice or passive voice uh, is a decision you make before you uh, utter a sentence. And this is certainly a syntactic property. You know, I knew a guy in high school, he would never say, uh, I didn't do my homework. He would always say, the homework wasn't done. And that implies, you know, in some sense, he's like, oh, it was not his fault. It didn't happen or something. But it always was his fault, of course. So it's sort of like, you know, that's when you write a headline for something. It's like, uh, you, can, you can sort of bias away the fault of someone by, the way a certain thing is phrased, you know. It wasn't done communicates a different kind of uh, what the noun is of that sentence, what the, what the verb is acting upon, versus I didn't do my homework, which is, means that I wasn't the one who did the homework, uh, instead of the homework having the property of not being finished. Something like this, right? So active-passive voice is a syntactic property, but those two sentences technically communicate the same semantic object. They still have the same meaning. Um, but under, if in sort of pre-language idea of the way uh, you may transform the idea in your head, it does not preserve semantic properties. A semantic property definitely is truthfulness, is a semantic property. Now, this is not only a semantic property. In some sense, this is the strongest semantic property. There are semantic properties of sentences that perhaps are disagreed upon, but of the sentences that are disagreed upon, a sentence being true, as in a declarative statement of propositional calculus, a sentence being true or not is one which is the most unambiguous. It's the one that most people would agree. A sentence is true, you're going to find one outlier. You're not going to find 10% of the population. You know, Everyone's going to say the true sentence is true. Everyone's going to say the sentence is false. It's as unambiguous as the semantic properties can come. But a transformation of the syntax won't preserve the semantic property of the language. By transformation, we mean you have some sentence in your head, and you take as input the sentence. In some sense, your grammar is taking the sentence, parsing it, re-digesting it, and changing it. Before you utter it, you're trying to divert blame. You're going to change it to the passive voice. you know, And somehow it outputs the sentence. But such a, such a transformation of the syntax of a sentence does not even preserve the most basic semantic property. And this is what he says. So consider the same sentence. The way we'll prove this, we'll prove this by counterexample. We'll find a sentence such that the active voice is true, but the passive voice is not, or something like this, right? Uh, sentence one, everyone in the room knows two languages. Let's transform that sentence uh, passively at least two languages. Everyone 
in the room. We have made a syntactic change, yet we have changed the semantic meaning of the sentence. But we've simply changed the syntax of the sentence. The first sentence says, everyone in the room knows two languages. Uh, how many languages do you guys know? Who knows more than two languages? Who can speak more than two languages? Can everyone only speak one language? More than two? More than one. No. You know how many languages? I know two languages. Wait, are what? Russian and English. You know Russian and English? How many languages do you know? Two. Two. Okay. Everyone in the room knows two languages. I know one language. So the statement, everyone in the room knows two languages, is therefore false. Okay? At least two languages are known by everyone in the room. What two languages do you speak? English and Spanish. English and Russian. English. Anyone else? Any other language? Vietnamese. You know Vietnamese. That's four languages. So we know the room knows four languages. So at least two languages are known by everyone in the room. That's true because we know four, and four is more than two. So unfortunately, transforming uh, a sentence from uh, active voice to passive voice changes the most basic, simplest semantic property of the sentence, which is truthfulness. So such transformations that uh, this is another strike against the study of syntax being a study of semantic properties. Because even transformations of syntax will change the strongest, most basic semantic property of a sentence. You know, the meaning of a sentence changes as you change the syntax. So certainly you cannot study changes of syntax. The, the study of the, the meaning of a sentence is not invariant to this change of syntax of the sentence. Right? So this is another, uh, another blow to trying to study syntax from, trying to study the semantic value of a sentence by studying the syntax of a sentence. Right? Any questions on this example? Any, any other uh, qualms on, on uh, Noam Chomsky in general? Chomsky normal form? We'll talk about Chomsky normal form in a second, but any, any final questions on syntactic structures? Okay. Let's talk about the final problem Noam Chomsky solved uh, with some other guy. So given an automaton, you can determine easily if the automaton accepts or rejects the string by determining if, by just running the automaton on the, length, on the string. But you cannot determine easily if a grammar produces a string or doesn't produce a string. So given uh, W a uh, word, G a uh, C of G, is W in C, L C of G. So if G was not a G grammar but a uh, DFA, you can determine membership easily in the language by running the DFA on the word, right? Uh, you can determine it even for the NFA. But how do you determine if a word, if a conductory grammar produces a word? This is difficult in practice. Uh, the, what Chomsky does is he gives an algorithm to, deter, to, to solve this problem. To determine if a grammar produces a word actually may be easier. How do you determine if a grammar doesn't produce a word? It's, the grammar does not have any way to enumerate the languages it doesn't produce. It only exactly and only produces the correct sentences of English. Oh, not of English, but those sentences it produces. How do you know if it produces the if it doesn't produce a certain sentence? What as a way to ascertain a sentence that's ungrammatical relative to a certain grammar? So what he does is he invents something called Chomsky normal form, and we'll talk about how Chomsky normal form solves this problem in a second. Chomsky normal form. is a certain syntax of uh, context-free grammars. By the way, uh, if you ever want to have a theorem named after yourself, when you write a paper about it, what you should do is name it as generically as possible to annoy everyone uh, involved, so that they'll just name it uh, Chomsky's normal form, and then they'll drop that, because that's annoying, and they'll just call it Chomsky normal form. That's how every theorem ends up getting named. Uh, uh, Alan Turing didn't call them Turing machines. We'll talk about Turing machines later, but he never called them Turing machines. That would be uh, too egotistical. He called them automatic machines, or A machines for short. But then calling something an A machine is as generic as possible to distinguish it from other kinds of machines. So uh, we ended up renaming them for him, called Turing machines. Same thing with Chomsky normal form. Chomsky normal form, actually this paper was written by two people, Chomsky and Mueller, but no one remembers the other guy because they named it uh, 
normal form of context-free grammars. But now that there are several normal forms of context-free grammars, we don't know which one we're talking about in context. Is Griebach normal form, uh, other normal forms. So we renamed this one to distinguish it as Chomsky normal form. Things have to be called things in order to address them, right? So that's Chomsky normal form. A CFG is in Chomsky normal form if the following are true. The rules only look like one non-terminal goes to two non-terminals, one non-terminal goes to one terminal, S goes to the empty string if and only if the empty string is produced uh, by the, is, if the empty string is in the language. Uh, uh, start symbol, start non-terminal, does not appear on the right-hand side of any rule. If these four specifications are met, then we say the grammar is in something called Chomsky normal form. Now, every grammar that's in Chomsky normal form is certainly a context-free grammar. For the same reason that every regular grammar is a context-free grammar, it's just a generalization. Right? These are spec these are specifics. This is a specification. It's a non a opposite of a generalization, uh, a specialization of, of a grammar. Yet every grammar can be put into Chomsky normal form. So we'll describe a procedure to convert every grammar into Chomsky normal form. So uh, you follow the following steps, and the grammar will be converted to Chomsky normal form. Now, why do we care to convert a grammar to Chomsky normal form? We'll describe that in a minute, because grammars with Choms in Chomsky normal form have certain important properties. Uh, first, you add new start state, new start non-terminal, s not, and production, s not goes to s. By doing so, this already guarantees this second thing that we need. The, the start non-terminal does not appear on the right-hand side of any rule. By doing that first step, you've already solved that problem, right? Two, uh, delete and patch uh, A goes to epsilon rules. So for example, if you had like, uh, I don't know, A goes to epsilon and then like B goes to a, uh, A, B, uh, let's say, I don't know, a D, A, C, or something. What you would do is transform that into wherever those productions would exist. So you would change that to B goes to A, or uh, D, C, or Epsilon. And then you would patch out the B goes to epsilon rule wherever that appears as well. So basically, you, you patch out the production. The epsilon production is only allowed at the start non-terminal. It's only allowed from S0. It's not allowed from any other non-terminal. And so wherever you could have taken that production, you delete it. This, is, this in some sense, eliminates all uh, productions that produce no length strings. Right? Uh, three. Remove unit rules. So a unit rule is like if you have like A goes to B and then B goes to C. This is annoying. And so instead you patch that out as you just have uh, A goes to C instead, right? Instead of having a chain of, uh, of non-terminals, you just, just cut the shortcut out and you have A immediately goes to C, right? Um, four, convert uh, rules with right-hand side uh, greater than or equal to two into a set of rules as follows. Let's say you have uh, A goes to U1, that's, that's UK where u1 through uk are either terminals or non-terminals. This is equivalent to having uh, the sequence of productions. Uh, a goes to uh, u1, a1, and then a1 
goes to U2 UK. Would you agree? Recursively apply this, and then you'll be left with only uh, a sequence of productions that have length 2 on the right-hand side. This eliminates rules of length 0. This eliminates rules of length 1. This eliminates rules of length uh, greater than 2. So in some sense, after you eliminate 0 rules, 1 rules, and greater than 2 rules, all rules are going to have length 2 or more. right? And then the final, finally, um, replace uh, non-terminal, excuse me, non-terminal, terminal on right-hand side of any rule with terminal, with non-terminal. So for example, let's say you have I don't know, A goes to little b, capital C. What you would do is change this to be uh, A goes to capital B, capital C. B goes to little b. Right? All this does is it makes it more complicated, but it enforces that every production looks like this. Every production is to two non-terminals. If a terminal is produced at all, it goes to a single terminal. Right? Now, the importance of Chomsky normal form we'll get into in a second. But are there any questions on just the syntax of Chomsky normal form? If you apply this procedure, sometimes adding, removing unit rules may add an epsilon rule or something. So you may have to go back through several times to convert a grammar to Chomsky normal form. Any questions on this so far? OK, let's convert a grammar to Chomsky normal form, and then we'll talk about the importance of Chomsky normal form. Actually, let's talk about the importance of Chomsky normal form. If, if uh, G is in Chomsky normal form and uh, W it has length greater than or equal to 1, then uh, any production of W uh, takes exactly 2n minus 1 productions. If the length of w is 0, it's just the empty string. And you can quickly determine if the grammar produces that by checking if the start non-terminal has uh, an epsilon rule. That's the only time that the grammar produces the empty string. But for all other cases, you can check, you can, uh, the, if a word is produced by the grammar at all, it will do so in exactly 2n minus 1 productions. Here's the algorithm then to determine if a grammar produces a word. Brute force search all 2n minus 1, uh, all possible 2n minus 1 productions, and you enumerate this big list. If your word is in that list, then the grammar produced it. If your word is not in the list, then your grammar didn't produce it. That's how you do it. So, kind of a brute force way, but it does technically solve the problem. Now, would you do this in practice? Maybe not, if you're doing it with like pen and paper. But this shows that the problem of determining if a context grammar doesn't produce a word can be solved. Right? It's not impossible. It's not something egregious. Here's the proof. Let uh, w uh, equal uh, w1 to wn. So it is uh, a sequence of non-terminals, right? Now, let's rewind the clock backwards and to, uh, to see what intermediary working strings could the context-free grammar have produced from. Now, notice that the rules of, uh, of uh, C and F form have that every if a terminal is produced, it was after an application of a rule that was one non-terminal to one terminal. So each of these non-terminals had to have come from exactly one terminal. Perhaps they're, they're, we're not specifying what order the productions are done, but they definitely each came from exactly one non-terminal. So from there, we know that there was a string of non-terminals. I'll call them n1 to nn. No, that's not good. Uh, let's say a1 to an, where a1 through an are all non-terminals, perhaps not distinct. right? 
How many productions does it take to go from uh, W1, WN to A1 to AN backwards? N. Yeah. Now, we have a string of N non-terminals. If we rewind the clock all the way, we will uh, begin where? At the start non-terminal, right? Now, notice by the productions of the rules, you go from one non-terminal, you delete it, and you add two non-terminals. So to go from n non-terminals to one non-terminal, each time you apply a production, you can add at most one non-terminal. You can't add 10 non-terminals. You remove one and add two, you, you net one non-terminal. So you have n non-terminals, and you have a start non-terminal. How many productions does it take you to go from one non-terminal to n non-terminals? n minus 1. Therefore, to go from s to w, so therefore, to go from s to w takes 2n minus 1 productions, QED. Takes exactly 2n minus 1. Questions on that proof? Really obvious, I think, right? Simple counting. Um, Let's convert a grammar into Chomsky normal form and then, conf and, and then confirm the uh, 2n minus 1. Consider the grammar. S goes to A, S, B, or epsilon. And this is the grammar for uh, A to the N, B to the N, N is a number, right? Let's convert this into Chomsky normal form. Uh, first, we're going to add a new start state. So I'm going to draw these lines to denote when I'm transforming the grammar. S0 goes to S, uh, and S goes to A, S, B, or epsilon, right? Now notice that we have epsilon rules, and we need to delete and patch those. So what we'll do is we'll get rid of this s goes to epsilon and replace that wherever epsilon appears. So we're going to have s0 goes to s or epsilon, s goes to asb or ab, and no longer epsilon. Did we correctly patch that out? I think so. Let me just check my... All right. Now we also have a unit rule, though. S0 goes to S. Let's delete and patch that out. We're going to have S0 goes to whatever S goes to, which is going to be ASB or AB, and as well as the remaining epsilon. And then S is going to remain unchanged, ASB or AB. We agree? Is the grammar getting uglier? Yes. Is it getting closer to Chomsky normal form? Also yes. All right, now we have, unfortunately, rules of length longer than two. So I'm going to transform these in the following way. I'm going to have S0 is going to go to AX or AB or epsilon. S is going to go to AX, uh, AB, and then X is going to go to SB. We agree again. All I've did is I cut that SB off here, and I cut that SB off here. So now these have length 1, excuse me, length 2. All the rules have length 2. Uh, is every rule of length 2? Yes. But now I have non-terminals uh, on the right-hand side. Excuse me, terminals on the right-hand side. Let's replace those with non-terminals. S0 goes to AX or AB or Epsilon. S goes to AX, AB, uh, X goes to SB, A goes to little a, and B goes to little b. All right, that grammar is now in Chomsky normal form. Do we agree? Any steps, any missed, everything's there? Uh, let's write out a production using this grammar and try to count how many uh, rules it takes, right? So this grammar being A to the N, B to the N should produce 
AABB. Let's try to produce this string and see if we can count how many productions it takes. So we're going to go S0 is going to go to um, uh, AX. And AX is then going to go to, X will go to SB, so ASB. Awesome. Now XB is going to, uh, S, we can go then to AB. Awesome. And then we can go from each of these to be a non-terminal. So A, A, B, B. A, A, B, B. A, A, B, B. A, A, B, B. Right? So that's the production of the string. How many did this take? Hopefully seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. OK. Because and it takes 2 and minus 1 for a string of length 1. So 2 and minus 1 is equal to 2 times 4. Minus 1 is equal to 7. OK, good. So it takes exactly seven productions to produce a string of length 4. Is this the shortest, smallest, cleanest, cutest grammar? No. But then by putting all strings of the same length on the same number of productions, you can determine easily if a string produces a word uh, as easy as you can determine if a string doesn't produce a word. Again, a context-free grammar is non-deterministic, so it's not obvious to say which which productions do you apply to get the right string out? That's kind of difficult to, to, to determine. Any questions on Chomsky normal form? All right.